Hi, I'm Pastor Matt, the pastor at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Westchester, Ohio. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this weekend. Please be sure to check out our website at ctkluth.org for more information about our mission and our ministry and to find ways that you can join us in creatively bringing God's Word to life. Now I invite you to focus your hearts and your minds on our Lord and Savior Jesus as we experience worship together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. On this, the third weekend in Advent, I invite you to join me in prayer as we light the candles of our Advent wreath. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come near. Open our hearts to receive your Son, Jesus Christ, and let us know that he is more than enough. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come near. Open our hearts to receive your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we may know that he makes all things new. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come near. Open our hearts to receive your Son, Jesus Christ. that we may know that there is hope in the midst of a world filled with trouble and conflict. All this we ask in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ 
before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time for our gospel interruption. This time of year, we love to put out our decorations in our houses, and I have a collection of manger scenes. This is a creche that we own at the church. It actually, I believe, was made in Italy. It's rather rugged and rustic looking, and I like it a lot. So this is the time where we pick all of the animals and figure out where they're supposed to go. So this looks like it probably be a good spot for the cow and here's a beautiful little donkey we'll hide him back in the corner he's peeking in he had a long journey to bethlehem um, we have a sheep who's looking on with interest let's see we also have a mother and a little baby lamb i think that's quite significant for the story and then Here's a shepherd, and he's got a flute he's playing. We don't want him to disturb the baby too much, so we'll put him farther back in this way, because shh, it's a newborn baby. And then uh, here's Joseph, and we've got Mother Mary, and look, she is adoring the Christ child. And our manger is almost set up, but we're missing the baby. We're missing Jesus. I've got it. See this? This is the Bible. And Martin Luther has a marvelous way to describe what the Bible does for us. We have another word for it, a fancy word called scripture. But Martin Luther says, scripture is the manger in which the Christ child is born. We call Jesus the Word of God made flesh. Emmanuel, come with us. God's living and breathing Word who came to show us God's love. Some people will try and use Scripture to beat people over the head, or they will try and justify themselves. In our Gospel reading today, Jesus is talking to a group of people who are searching the scriptures in order to assure themselves of salvation. And salvation is staring them right in the face and they can't even recognize it. Sometimes we get so focused on the words of scripture that we forget to see Christ present in them, to allow them to breathe in our hearts and our minds and to experience the gospel and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So that's where we'll put that, right there. So that the Christ child can be born in all of us through God's word. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. We thank you for offering us your word come to life that we might know our salvation and experience your love in a personal and close way. Help us not to look for our salvation in mere words, but to truly understand your word come to life in Jesus. All this we ask in his name. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I have a testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father has given me to complete, the very works that I am doing, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. 
and the Father who sent me has himself testified on my behalf. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you because you do not believe in him whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that testify on my behalf. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. If another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one who alone is God. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh who dwells among us. Amen. There's a great story about the old-style film comedian W.C. Fields, I know that this is an old reference. For many of you, you might not even know who he is. Google him. Look him up. He has some of the funniest comedies you have ever seen. But he also had an issue with alcoholism. And as he was in a hospital, he was recovering from deliria tremens, his friends came in to find him thumbing through the Bible, probably a Gideon's Bible that had been left there. They knew that he was not a person of faith by any stretch. So they wondered what in the world he was doing. And someone said, W.C., why are you reading the Bible? And he said, I'm looking for loopholes. I think that that's a story for all of us. Jesus is confronting people today who are looking at Scripture as the be-all, end-all. He accuses them of looking for their salvation in God's holy word without recognizing that it is staring them in the face. Too often, the word of God is not living and breathing. It is cold and dead on a page. There are a lot of people who can memorize Scripture. They can know it backwards and forwards. They will put Scripture up on the wall. They can recite it to you, chapter and verse, and treat the Bible as if it is a prescription for every ill that you have. You have a sore foot? Well, Hezekiah 14 has something to say about that. Side note, Hezekiah 14 really isn't a book in the Bible. I'm just using that particular illustration here in my sermon. The Bible is not a how-to manual. It is a fine dining guide to life. We believe that the Word of God in the Scriptures is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it has been filtered down through human hands, and sometimes they will contradict each other in stories that they tell or ideas that come about. But there is this overarching thing that is present all throughout Scripture. The Old Testament shows how human beings have rebelled against God and how they have a need for a Savior. And the New Testament tells us the story of how Jesus came to be God, Emmanuel, near us. God in the flesh who says, I have come in my Father's name to save and redeem all of you. Put together, it shows us this marvelous arc from beginning to the end of the story in the Bible of our sinfulness and our redeeming 
by Jesus. But too often we forget that what's going on in the heart of this story is a story of love and compassion and grace. And we try and use Scripture to make people straighten up and fly right. You will hear people say, the Bible says, and then they will quote a passage to state their own position, their theological or political position, whatever it may be. And I'm quite reminded of the words of William Shakespeare that Satan can cite Scripture for his own purposes. We all can pick and choose what we would like to use from Scripture in order to bolster and justify ourselves. We can look at Scripture and say, I am saved. And we can point to other people and say, obviously they are condemned. And we miss the point completely of what is laid in Scripture. As we open it up, as we read and we wrestle with what is in front of us, Christ comes alive. This is why Martin Luther calls Scripture the cradle in which the Christ child is born. If we don't open up the Bible, if we don't read what is in there, there's no way we can come to know the truth of who Jesus is and continue to have our eyes and our minds opened to Christ's continual work in the world. But the church has forgotten that we don't worship Scripture. We worship Jesus. Nobody ever comes to church based on something that the author of the Gospel of John said or the author of the Philippians wrote. They come because they experience a Christ who is living and breathing amongst the people who are present in that worshiping community those people who are doing the hard work of living out the gospel. By themselves, scripture passages say nothing. They are simply words on a page that you and I read, and then we interpret them based on our own life experience and our own baggage. Listen, you probably have Bible verses that bring you great comfort. I know that I do. Jeremiah 29, 11 is actually on a plaque that hangs over my kitchen area. And it's been a Bible verse that has gotten me through some really difficult and and terrible times in my life when I was unsure of the next path that God had for me. So to hear that word that God promises not to harm but to help is important. But I can't take that passage out of context without knowing who the original audience is and say, well, see, God has this special plan just for me and for nobody else. The work that Scripture does on our hearts and our minds is help us to better know God's love, to challenge us, to turn from those things that are not giving us life to those things which are life-giving and can bring life to others. But it's not our job, yours or mine, to use Scripture as a stick to beat people over the head. When I travel from here in Westchester up north to Columbus to go visit the bishop's office, there are billboards that are along the way. On one side, as you're heading north, you can see all of the Ten Commandments laid out very clearly. The commandments, the law that were given to Moses, the same Moses that Jesus is arguing with those people who are finding their salvation in Scripture today. Interestingly enough, as you head south, coming down towards Cincinnati, you can see the words, hell is real, and where will you spend eternity? And the best part is the H has sparkly lettering like it's on fire. Listen, we can debate about the reality and existence of hell. There is scriptural basis for that. But nobody knows exactly what it means. And as a witnessing tool, giving people scripture verses about hell is not going to help them experience the love of Christ. Our job isn't to save people. That's above my pay grade and above your pay grade as well. Our job is to love as we have been loved. 
This is what Jesus is telling these people who have come. That he has come in the name of the Father, and that in the words of the Scripture, yes, they might be able to find the law. They might be able to find the legalistic way to do things. But walking along the path of the law does not save anyone. It is Christ's coming in the flesh to fulfill the law because we could not that saves us. When we get ready to head into the Lenten season, before all of that takes place, we tell the story of transfiguration. Jesus goes on top of the mountain and this amazing epiphany takes place. He is transfigured. His real form is shown. And Peter, James, and John see as he is standing between Moses and Elijah. Standing there, Jesus becomes the fulfillment of the law and of the prophets. His identity is finally known. That is the Jesus that we are called to know and called to share. We're not called to tell people to turn back, to worry about where they're going to spend eternity. Listen, eternity is a long time, and people are worried about what they're going to have for lunch. So a lot of times they're not even concerned about what's happening farther off. If we know a God who is filled with grace, we can reveal that grace to others by living out the Scripture, not by putting it on a bumper sticker and driving terribly around or by wearing a shirt that has a Bible verse on it. If you've ever seen the movie or read the book, Treasure Island, there is a Bible-spouting captain who is anything but Christian. And the one-legged pirate Long John Silver turns to young Jim after they have been marooned. And he says to him, then what quotes scripture don't always live by it, young Jim? And that's a lesson to learn. To allow the word of God to live and multiply in our hearts means that we can understand the promise of who Jesus is. That it's not the words that save us. It's not the empty Bible verses that bring others to Jesus. It is our witness of love and God's grace that continue to do that work of salvation. Jesus himself says he hasn't come to condemn people. He allows the law of Moses to do that for everyone. If we look hard at the law, we see how we have failed. But the heart of the law is love. Love for God and love for our neighbor. And we fail to love we fail to love God, we fail to love our neighbor, and that's where Jesus comes in to rescue us from our failure, to show us what true love is. Simply putting the Bible on a table or under your pillow or having it on your shelf and say, well, I guess I'm good enough, does not make Christ come alive for us. And it's a challenge. In the Lutheran Church, we like to read Scripture for you. We'll have it all printed out. We're ready to go with that. But we don't challenge you to wrestle during the rest of the week. It's something that we pastors have to work on. It's a cultural piece. But every time you crack open that Scripture, you can ask God to show you where Jesus is present in the midst of what you are reading, and you'll be surprised to experience the real Christ showing up. In the Old Testament, where the prophecies come from Isaiah, we can see Christ as the one who knows to choose the good over the evil. In the writings of Paul in Ephesians, we can experience the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Christ shows up again and again and again. And through Scripture, Christ is born in our hearts. But unless we are willing to dive in and do the hard work of asking questions, of wrestling, Scripture simply becomes a totem that we use in order to signal our righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It's not your righteousness. It is the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ that we encounter the promises of God 
in God's Word, printed on the page, and come to life through Jesus Christ, which continue to guide and lead us. Jesus is the Word of God. Come to dwell near us. Come to live with us in our hearts and to inspire us to show others that same love. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Gathered together in the presence of God and of one another, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us the gift of your word, your holy scripture. Open our hearts and our minds to its promise of life through your son, Jesus. Keep us from using it as a cudgel to beat others over the head. When we wrestle with its promises and its challenges, grant us peace and insight. Help us to embody your Son in the world. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we thank you for the beauty of the seasons. As we watch fall turn into winter, we ask that you would be with all who are dealing with cold, with homelessness, with fear for their safety during this time. Be present with all so that they may experience the wonder of winter and not the worry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, we ask that you would be with all who are struggling today. Those who wait with anticipation for diagnoses those who are continuing to undergo treatment for various diseases, and those who wait helplessly by while they watch their loved ones suffer. Be with all who are receiving medical care. Bless caregivers. Bless all who continue to be on the front lines of caring for those who have influenza, COVID-19, and RSV. Provide all who give medical hope the energy to continue their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of life, we ask that your presence and your light would shine as these days darken. Be with all who sit in the dark and grieve and worry whether or not light will shine in their lives once again. We thank you for all of those saints who have gone before us to show us the power of waiting and watching during Advent. Pour out your peace and comfort to all who grieve and mourn the loss of loved ones that they may rest in the promise given to them through your holy word, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers and the prayers of our hearts we lift up to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this weekend. Please be sure to check out our Facebook page and to like us so that you can keep up to date on our most recent mission and ministry activities. Now, a challenge for you as you head out into the world during this Advent season, to think about how you use Scripture. Is it a cudgel? Is it a comfort? How often do you spend time wrestling with God's Word? The more time you spend with God's Word, the more Christ will appear in your life and will appear in real form to you. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and grant you peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Captive Israel
是。